A few thank yous first. English Theatre Berlin, Daniel, Gunther, it's wonderful you're hosting this. Thank you very much for the chance. Um, a big thank you to the American Embassy. Um, this, this means a lot to the book. It means a lot to this writer. Uh, it's a great, great opportunity, and I'm grateful. Um, thank you to my publisher, Catherine Nicely, Palm Art Press. And uh, there are a lot of people. Ruben Gracias, Andre per la Musica, Thomas Herbert, and a lot of friends. Um, this, this looks like a party at our house, <laughs> except it's bigger. Because a lot of friends, and I'm really grateful for everyone who showed up. Um, the book is uh, all of the above. Um, you got your love, you got your alcohol, you got your American in Spain, the whole checklist. I think as a category, maybe it fits most comfortably as uh, in German, it's called a Bildungsroman. Um, because it is the story about uh, characters who change or do not change, some more successfully than, than the others. Um, and so it happens to be set in, in this place and at this time. It, it does try to be a story about change, and that, that could happen anywhere. Um, Cadiquez, for those who don't know, and most don't, is an incredible little village in the far north of Spain. And many things make it special. One is that the coast of Spain has been so largely, I want to say, destroyed, it sort of stripped of its soul, with these big hotels, all, all the construction in the boom days. And somehow Cadiquez avoided that. So you have to go on a little winding road, and you come to this little village where the buildings are low and, uh, and, and the pace of life slows down. Um, and I really like that. And I'm not the only one. A lot of artists have responded to that over the years, especially beginning of the last century. Um, this was the, the village where I'm going to say, I'm going to just rattle off some of the names in this tiny village. Salvador Dali, Marcel Duchamp, René Magritte, Man Ray, Picasso, André Breton, Garcia Lorca, uh, John Cage, Louis Bonuel. E extraordinary. I mean, these giants who shaped 20th century art and aesthetics. And, uh, and so you fast forward and you go there today, and there are still artists, there are still writers. Not everyone is filling those, um, those shoes as, as successfully as they might wish. And that's where the book comes in. OK. I, I, I think that's a perfect introduction. I think we should, should start with the reading. Great. Um, I will start reading with the, the very beginning, begin at the beginning, uh, the first two pages. <clears throat> the electric buzz, the multitasking, the breathless pace, the cell phones, <laughs> that could keep one an arm's distance from one's own thoughts, the high <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to start again. The electric buzz, the multitasking, the breathless pace that could keep one an arm's distance from one's own thoughts, the high octane rush of every this and that coming at you at once, 24-7. Cadiquez was not the place for such things. A slower pace here, one step at a time. Where a mother finding a condom in a teenager's nightstand could still constitute high drama. No car chases or shady corporate mergers, 
or bombs exploding, <clears throat> excuse me, or bullets flying. No billion dollar robberies or shiny shoes in the corridors of power. Here, bare feet on the beach, already a thrill, and having time to think. It's what they had come for, Picasso and the others. Not that bigger things did not happen here also. Death, for instance, visited this village too. The winding road could not keep that horseman from his rounds. But for the most part, the, the dramas here were on the slower order of a chess game versus the clackety-clack of checkers. A little sex, a little wine, a little fighting, the company of friends. In Cadiquez, it was enough. Now, we, uh, the beginning of the first chapter, this is a fellow, an Englishman, named Robert. He has been drinking. He is standing at the bar in one of the local watering holes, talking to two British aristocrats who were visiting the village. Sex and drugs and rock and roll, darling, and violence. That's what they want. The world they know can't give them beauty anymore. Beauty is passé. Beauty is yesteryear, darling. Get over it. He's drunk. Drunk, madam. I, I... He took a deep breath. The head hung forward. The eyes closed, but only for a moment. The batteries recharged almost instantly. The eyes pried themselves back open. The head lifted itself. We are all drunk on the elixir of life. He stretched out the word life as if doing so could lengthen the thing itself. Have a sip of life, darling. It's delicious. And now I jump a little bit, chapter four. The bus was starting down the mountain through the Parafita Pass. Looking across the aisle and out the window to his left, Cal could see the little fishing village of El Port de la Selva on the edge of the sea below. The border with France was just 20 kilometers beyond that. They kept moving. And a few minutes and few curves later, there it was, the first glimpse of Cadiquez ahead in the distance. Still about a thousand olive trees away, beside the deep blue of the sea and beneath the blue of the sky was a line of low white buildings, small cubes stacked next to each other. From here, the village looked like something organic, not imposed on the landscape like so many other towns along the coast, but as if it had grown here. A bed of white quartz crystals with people living among them. I jumped a bit. I'm sorry, but that's okay. And to, uh, um, I think now, Thomas will read something in German. I'll say one, one thing, that the place is, is like a character in the book, very important, its personality. Alcohol is like a central character in this story. Thomas now will read um, some bits that touch on that. Bevor Karl den Satz beenden konnte, sah er etwas aus dem Augenwinkel. Es war eine Bierflasche, die auf seinen Kopf zuflog. Instinktiv duckte er sich weg. Die Flasche verfehlte ihn knapp. Beim Abtauchen hatte er seinen Brandy verschüttet. 
Das war guter Brandy, schrie Karl, nicht um witzig zu sein. Er platzte einfach so aus ihm heraus, wie das Kiai, das man beim Karate schreit. Karl hatte einmal Karateunterricht genommen, einen Einführungskurs über fünf Wochen. Fünf Wochen reichten nicht, um gut Karate zu lernen, aber zwei wichtige Dinge hatte er gelernt. Erstens, schrei deinen Gegner an wie ein Wahnsinniger, damit er sich vor Angst in die Hose macht. Damit kommst du auch selbst in Fahrt. Und zweitens, zerstöre die Bedrohung. Die Bewegungen waren nicht elegant. Karl rutschte dabei sogar aus. Aber es gelang ihm, nach oben zu greifen und Brunos Arm zu packen, den er so stark verdrehte, dass etwas knackte. Die Bierflasche flog durch die Gegend, das Glas ging zu Bruch. Die meisten Leute im Raum hörten auf zu tanzen. Dann saß Karl auf Brunos Oberkörper mit erhobener Faust. Aber er sah, dass es keinen Sinn hatte, ihn zu schlagen. Der arme Junge schrie wegen seines Arms und versuchte, sein Gesicht zu schützen. Ohne Bierflasche in der Hand und durch das Überraschungsmoment war er chancenlos. »Wirst du dich jetzt benehmen?« schrie Karl, immer noch mit erhobener Faust. »Fick dich«, sagte Bruno, aber es war die Stimme eines Unterlegenen, der sich einen Rest stolz bewahrte. Karl respektierte ihn sogar dafür. »Das soll wohl Ja heißen.« und es springt jetzt also sozusagen aus diesem äh, Barfight äh, in das, was konsequenterweise kommen muss, nämlich den Hangover. Und intern haben wir das, glaube ich, so das Hangover-Chapter hier genannt. genannt. Karl hatte, soweit er sich erinnern konnte, in seinem Leben nur zweimal einen Kater gehabt. Ein Gefühl, das der Magen verrottete, wie nach dem Tod. Und auch der Rest des Körpers, wenn gleich noch nicht ganz tot, verfaulte. Ein Wundbrand des Geistes. Der Kopf so schwer, dass er ihn kaum anheben konnte. Und eine ungeheure Schwäche. Kaum genug Kraft, um zu würgen. Und selbst das war vergeblich, weil es nichts mehr gab, was hätte hochkommen können. Nur trockenes Würgen, Schweiß, Zittern, und der Wunsch zu sterben. So hatte er sich genau zweimal gefühlt. Heute war nicht einer dieser Tage. Trotzdem war es näher dran, als ihm lieb war. Mit ein wenig Glück wachte er normalerweise nach einer Nacht wieder gestrigen auf und fühlte sich in den ersten Minuten nur lahm und schwer und unsicher. Das dauerte eine Stunde oder höchstens zwei. Es begann mit einem Geräusch, Irgendwas, irgendwo. Dann eine langsame Bewegung. Und schließlich, wenn es nicht mehr zu vermeiden war, Licht. Ein Auge ging auf, wie um auszukundschaften, ob das zweite Auge gefahrlos aufgehen konnte. Dann wurden Fingerzehen und Mund langsam getestet. Eine Bestandsaufnahme des ganzen Körpers. Mit etwas Glück war alles noch da. Dann der Versuch, einen Gedanken zu fassen, was nicht gleichzusetzen ist mit Denken. Und dann die Grenzen dessen testen, sich zu erinnern, zu erklären. Erklären war normalerweise am schwersten. Zu verstehen, warum aus so schönen Stunden so furchtbare werden konnten. Dann schließlich beinahe aus dem Bett den Rest aufgerichtet und sich wohl oder übel dem neuen Tag gestellt. Wie fühlst du dich? Gut, hör mal, tut mir leid wegen gestern Abend. Oh, darum macht dir keine Sorgen. Tut mir leid für dich. Ich weiß nicht, was passiert ist. Naja, du hast zu viel getrunken. So viel nun auch wieder nicht. Sie zählte es an den Fingern ab. Das war die letzte Liste der Welt, die Karl jetzt hören wollte. Ein Campari Soda, wir hatten eine Flasche Wein im Restaurant, wovon du das meiste getrunken hast, dann zwei Brandys, ein Glas Champagner, noch zwei Brandys, drei Brandy, Brandy Soda. Sie hielt zehn Finger hoch. Ein Finger stand für die Flasche Wein. Er machte sich darüber lustig. Wenigstens habe ich aufgehört, bevor du mit den Zehen hättest weiterzählen müssen. Außerdem hast du drei Joints geraucht, im Auto, hier und auf der Brücke. Du hast ein verdammt gutes Gedächtnis. 
Okay, Michael. But then there's going over the, the line. And some of the characters in this book step over the line, as I did for a long time. And that's where Cow and Michael intersect. Because I, I did a lot of research for drunk, stoned, and stupid. <laughs> I really became like an expert in stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a development in the novel. In the beginning, Carl sort of, you know, drink is, uh, you know, is, is part of the game, but it's sort of rather playful. You know, playful, you know, people drink, have fun, but it becomes more and more of a problem the more he falls in love with this young woman. And then there is a second part, sort of a final chapter, which takes place in Berlin, and there is, uh, uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but Carl, uh, tries to overcome his, you know, he realizes he's got a problem, tries to overcome his addictive cycle. So now my question is, and I took it from Zeit magazine, which you might know, there's a final column which always says in Zeit magazine, das war meine Rettung, this was my rescue. So was there anything like it, you know, because like, there seemed to be a cathartic moment in the novel when it comes to using alcohol, using drugs, is there, is there a cathartic moment that this was based on, or is, did you just do it for the, for the effect uh, to have sort of, you know, something to twist around the plot? No, yeah, I mean, th there is, a, I, you know, I, I was trying to make a joke of it, 30, 35 years of research to, to do this. Um, and there is, there's the funny side, unless you're inside it, unless you're married to the guy, or you're the guy's kid, or you're trying to have a serious relationship with. Um, and I make no secret of the fact that I was, um, I was basically drunk and stoned from the age of 12 to 47. 35 years. And um, it, you know, it, in the beginning it was fun and it was that cha-cha-cha and then it got to be this, you know, and, um, and so I had my own reasons why finally, you know, I like pried those, those fingers off and I'm sitting here now for, for 10 years. On March 9th, it will be 10 years since I've had a drink and, you know, if, if I make it to March 9th. A little later in their story, he walks her home, and she is still committed to this other relationship. So he is not able to kiss her goodnight. The middle of the village was crowded with music and people spilling out of the discotheque L'Ostal. Young women in small dresses, young men clustered around them. Behind the little cove, Cal followed Layla up one of the small, dark passageways. She stopped. Well, th this is where I live. It was a white house with bougainvillea climbing up its side. They stood there a moment. Well, good night. Good night. Slow kisses on cheeks. Right cheek, left cheek. Good night. Good night. He turned and walked back the way they had come. <laughs> no way, no fucking way he could sleep after that. Straight to the bar Imperial. No one there. Then to the bar Casino. Everyone there. Cal didn't hear a word his friends were saying. Didn't even pretend to pay attention. All of it just background noise while over one brandy after another, he kept playing certain scenes over in his mind. Finally, one last drink and then back out into the night. Only one thing to do now. Since he couldn't kiss her goodnight, he would kiss her house goodnight. <laughs> he made his way back to it. There were shadows against the wall as he pressed his lips to it, his hands slowly rubbing against the white paint. Good night, he whispered to the wall. Good, good night. Next chapter. 
Were you kissing my house? What? I said, were you kissing my house? Paul, that's the old man, said that last night he couldn't sleep, and so he went outside on our terrace for some air, and he heard something, so he looked down, and he says he saw you kissing the front of our house. Now, why would you do that? Um, they were standing in the middle of the village. Why would you do that? Because. Well, now you sound like Paul. Because is not an answer. Why would you kiss the front of my house? Because those were magic kisses? What's a magic kiss? Um, a magic kiss is a kiss that passes through, <coughs> that passes through walls and then it floats inside a house, and then it waits just inside the front door for a special person to come home. And every time she comes home, if she stops inside her door and closes her eyes, then she can feel the magic kiss. Oh, well, okay then. At, at least now I understand what a magic kiss is. Now we've heard sort of the beginning of a very tender and passionate love affair, but before this love affair started, Carl had to do something very cruel in order to, to, to start his affair with Jaeger. There is one scene in the book um, where he, um, he, when he meets Jaeger, the first thing that we just heard, he still had an affair, uh, which was not a big love affair, but it was an affair, a summer affair, with Cassandra, and he was invited to Cassandra's parents. I think these were the rich Liechtenstein, was the rich Liechtenstein family. And while he was there, introduced to mother and father and brother, he stands on the balcony and, you know, sees Rega over there. So uh, while being introduced to the parents of, you know, his girlfriend, he has nothing better to do than start a major flirt talking to a girl from the balcony. When I read that, I thought, God, what a miserable character. You know, I mean, uh, we, I, I, how can a person possibly behave like that? I mean, an embarrassing scene of the first order. I mean, well written, but uh, very embarrassing nevertheless. And then I thought, okay, is this Michael Ledra's alter ego? He must have been such an asshole. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to say that, but... Uh, Um, no, I don't want to go into that. I, I just, I just, you know, thought, you know, there are these elements of uh, tenderness and, and cruelty, but that the, the, the tender, the, the kissing of the wall, where, where, where did that come from? Where did that idea come from? Beautiful idea, uh, kissing a house. Yeah, thank you. That, that actually came from an old Persian, uh, Terence, this came from an old Persian love story. Terence, you probably know the story, Leila and Majnun. Sure. And that's where the girl's name comes from. And Majnun meant sort of the crazy one. And in the story, um, which, which is, uh, I, I think it predates 9th century, uh, 10th century, um, the boy is so in love with this girl that he goes crazy. The father won't let him be with her. And he writes her name in the sand. And he wanders in the desert. And he, kiss, and he kisses her house. So Cal has read the story, and he's, he, he acts out. There's another scene where he writes in the sand, and uh, he's trying to charm her by, by acting on this old Persian love story. As far as painful, um, yeah, it was, it, it's not easy to remember you know, vomiting um, in front of your friend's mother. <laughs> It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's almost worse than doing it at the time. Um, so there were a lot, of, a lot of moments, but, you know, the, the, the behavior... I used to make jokes when I was drinking. Um, I would say, I drink better when I drive. You know, it doesn't get more stupid than that. And I used to, I used to love, I don't know why, I loved to drink and climb. 
So I fell from the fourth story of my apartment building in uh, Spain because I was climbing up the balconies. And uh, there's a scene in here where Cal climbs onto the roof. I think we're going to hear it um, in German. Climbs on the roof of this church in Cadaquez. That never happened in my life. I, cl I climbed on the roof of the church in Strasbourg. <laughs> but the magic about fiction is you can you know, move it from, from there to here and shape it to use it in the story. I think that's, that's the word I was waiting for, fiction. And uh, you also said Persian. You, you got this from a Persian idea. I mean, the whole writing process. I mean, how, how does it work? Because, I mean, that's one of the things I think one always wants to know. Are you the, uh, are you the kind of Thomas Mann uh, person, you know, getting up at 8, writing till 12, uh, break, digestion, walk through the, uh, 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 through the park, or are you sort of uh, driven by, you know, today is a day of writing, today is a day of not writing. Are you, you know, one of these systematic writers or one of these driven by boosts of writing that suddenly come out. I mean, is there, now that you've established yourself as somebody who wants to do that and does that regularly, are you a writer with rhythm? Or? Yeah, I, I, I like, um, I, I personally like excess. I like 100%. So, you know, we're, my wife and I travel a lot and we do stuff and then when the writing starts, it's time to stop doing stuff externally and to start doing stuff internally. So I went now half a year, we didn't, we didn't leave Berlin almost. I, I almost didn't get out of my road. And I'm just, you know, traveling in, inside. And both ways there are adventures and, uh, and, and submersive. And does other uh, does reading play a role in your writing? Because I mean, you just mentioned the uh, the Persian uh, poem, the Persian story. Or are there some American writers that you that have influenced your writing, or you particularly like? Or are you not aware of that? Is that something that comes completely subconsciously and not something that goes into the writing process? I mean, you don't do reading to. Uh, it, it's something that comes. With, it, it stays with you, or is it something that you particularly use? Yeah, I think we all have our favorite, you know, and artists who influence us. Um, Thomas mentioned one for me, which, who was Hemingway, because when I was young and younger and read him, I thought, um, you know, there's some parts about this guy that I really like. Feel I understand an American who who loved being in Europe. He was a writer. He said yes to as much as he could, drank a lot. Um, I like his humor. He taught me a lot. He taught my generations a lot about writing, getting rid of extra words. Um, so he's a, so that, that was a big influence. And, and that, that time of the 20s, uh, they were, when they were inventing this, this new world, it wasn't a vacuum. It was Gertrude Stein, it was in the visual arts, the literary arts, whether it was Stravinsky scores in music, you know, everything was just going nuts. You could do anything. And you fast forward now, and it's very interesting because we, again, are at the beginning of a new century, like as they were. I think it's harder for the artist because we've just had a century of so much invention. You know, Picasso chopped things up and um, Cage minimalism or Beckett's, you know, uh, spare style or Joyce's fulsome style, trying this, trying that. Later, the 60s, Hendrix on guitar. It was a whole century of invention. Now we're at the beginning of a new century, and it's not as easy to, to shake it up. Because we, you know, it feels a lot like we've heard it, we've seen it, we've done it, we've smelled it. Um, and that's one of the challenges facing some of the characters in the book. How do you, 
How do you invent with, with that kind of excitement after a, a whole century of such invention? And Cadiquez was the place for it. So it seemed a natural setting for, for this story. Shall, shall we continue with some reading? Mm. Yeah. Maybe the relief? Yeah. yeah. Also, as wurde ja schon erwähnt, dass es auch so eine Art kathartische Wende in dem Buch dann gibt, durch den Alkoholdunst hindurch. Und das könnte also ein Teil davon sein, oder vielleicht der Anfang. Kerl hatte keine Lust, alleine schlafen zu gehen. Also, was nun? Leila lag mittlerweile in Pauls Bett. Draußen war niemand mehr unterwegs. Es war ruhig im Ort. Alles war geschlossen. Ein Hund suchte auf der Straße vergeblich nach seinem Herrchen. Karl war losgegangen und lief durch die Nacht. Dann dachte er sich, dass es wahrscheinlich das Beste wäre, auf das Dach der Kirche zu klettern und auf den Sonnenaufgang zu warten. Es war eine große Kirche und er musste die Möglichkeiten abwägen. Zwei Zypressen standen davor. Er stand auf dem Vorplatz und schaute hoch. Leider war keine von beiden hoch genug. Zu weit war es noch vom Gipfel des Baumes bis zum Dach. Also ging er hinten herum am Studio des Künstlers Richard Hamilton vorbei. Alles war zu, zu niedrig, zu hoch, zu weich. Schließlich sah er in einem schmalen Durchgang hinter der Kirche kleine Kieselsteine in bepflasterten Boden, die als Pfeil angeordnet waren. Die Spitze zeigte auf die Kirche. Für Karl war das ein Zeichen. Auf diesem Weg sollst du auf das Dach der Kirche klettern. Also tat er das. Erst eine Steinmauer hoch, Ziemlich leichte Übung. Dann auf die nächste Ebene kein Problem. Dann wurde es kniffliger. Da waren einige vorstehende Gewölbepfeiler, aber sie standen zu weit auseinander, um sich daran hochzuhangeln. Er wollte schon aufgeben und wieder runterklettern, als er ein Regenrohr sah. Sehr clever oder sehr dumm. Nahm er seinen Gürtel ab, schlang ihn um das Rohr und zog sich hoch wie ein Leitungsmonteur der einen Mast erklimmt, wenn auch nicht so elegant. Ächzend, lachend, mit sich selbst redend und blöde Witze reißend, kam er gut voran, bis er oben angekommen war. Dann gab das Rohr unter der Belastung plötzlich nach. Es gab ein Ruck, ein knarzendes Geräusch und das Metall verbog sich langsam. Karl suchte nach etwas anderem, um sich festzuhalten. Nichts, nada, das Rohr löste sich von der Mauer. Er instinktiv als absichtlich flog seine linke Hand hoch und umklammerte den Rand des Dachs. Was immer bisher gehalten hatte, hielt in dem Moment nicht mehr. Quietschend bewegte sich das Rohr von der Mauer weg, als Karls zweite Hand hochflog, das Dach zu fassen, bekam und alles tat, was sie konnte, um der ersten Hand zu helfen. Und nun hing er da mit baumelnden Füßen und hielt sich praktisch nur an einem agnostischen Gebet fest. Während seine Finger abrutschten, dachte er nach, so schnell es unter diesen Umständen ging. Er hatte weniger Angst, auf das erste Dach unter ihm, sondern durch das Dach zu fallen. Wenn das passiert, dachte er, leg eine Hand über deine Kehle und eine über deine Augen, damit sich kein Holzsplitter in eins von beiden bohrt. Was du wirklich brauchst, ist eine dritte Hand, um gleichzeitig deine Eier zu bedenken. Scheiße. Einmal tief durchgeatmet, um Körper und Seele zu beruhigen. Dann ein Ave Maria. Er ließ eine Hand los und versuchte, die gewölbten roten Ziegel auf dem Dach zu fassen zu bekommen. Er hoffte, dass er sich an der Wölbung würde festhalten können. Das konnte er nicht. Er hielt sich jetzt buchstäblich an nichts fest. Da das Glück mit den Betrunkenen und Idioten ist, haftete trotzdem noch etwas. Aber er spürte Feuchtigkeit. Das war nicht gut. Er schwitzte und seine Hand rutschte ab. Am Handgelenk spürte er etwas Scharfes. Einer der Ziegeln war gebrochen. Da war eine gezackte Kante. Er griff danach, 
Während seine Fingerspitzen sich an irgendetwas festkrallten, schaffte er es, sein linkes Bein auf das Dach zu schwingen. Dabei hörte er, dass etwas zerriss. Das Hemd, das Leila ihm geschenkt hatte, hatte sich in dem gebrochenen Rohr verfangen. Noch ein ratschendes Geräusch, als sein zweites Bein, das dem ersten unbedingt folgen wollte, sich seinen Weg nach oben bahnte. Und schließlich war er oben auf dem Dach der Kirche Santa Maria. Okay, Karl does do some wild things. He climbs on churches, he drinks a lot, he has wild parties. One of the reasons we already discussed, because he takes drugs and alcohol, but I think there might be another reason too. Maybe it's a far-fetched thought, but there is this book by um, Julia Christopher, which I admire. It's called Strangers to Ourselves. Uh, in German, I think it's called Fremde sind wir uns selbst. And it's about the experience of being abroad and of living abroad. And uh, one of the things she says is that when you are abroad and speak in a foreign language and live in a foreign country, you dare to say things that you otherwise would have never said, because in your mother tongue they might be too embarrassing, or in, in the foreign language is slightly more uh, direct, or you know, you're less subtle, or you dare, to, you dare to say things, you dare to do things, uh, if you're an expatriate or if you're in a different context. Is, is, is that something that's part of the story, or is that a far-fetched far thought? Would you be the same, would Cal be the same person if all these things had happened in, let's say, Santa Monica instead of uh, Um <clears throat> there, there are many stories that could be told in this little village. I do not, for instance, even try to tell the story of uh, local Catalonian population. I don't really say much about the fishermen. Um, many stories. I focus on these, uh, uh, we call them expatriates. Um, and here we're sitting in English theater Berlin, which is sort of a redoubt of people who are bringing uh, two cultures together, two languages together. And yeah, I think one, there's an excitement. I've always loved like frontiers. Uh, the blue hour, where, where morning be, uh, night becomes day, and again when day becomes night. Or when you're standing at the sea on the beach and the, the water meets the land. So I think that's something natural to this story, people from, one, from different places coming. There are two other parts of that. Um, when we look at a painting, you know, for instance, you, you don't look at a, at a painting like this. You, you, you have to stand back to get some perspective. So for me, I think living in Europe um, gives, gives the chance to look at my own country and my own culture. Um, I, I'm feeling emotional right now. With a, with a lot of pride and a lot of in, keen interest. And the next book I'm writing now is set in America. And I don't think I could do it without this without this this distance and um, yeah and the, the one other thing those of us who have chosen to live in another place we it's a really self-conscious act <coughs> of deciding to have this life or that life and if you stay in the place where your grandparents and your parents have lived Of course, that, that's also a choice. It might not be as self-conscious. So I'm fascinated with people who say, you know, I don't want to just take the cards that were dealt me. I want to, I want to play this out. And, uh, and that's how I feel living in a place that I have chosen.